J-Wars, Lessons Learned from Donald McQueen. Um, so please welcome Donald. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as you can see, my name is Donald McQueen. Uh, I've spent 13 years working on J-Wars and part of the uh, Tyo Maximus Cronus J-Wars. It wasn't official. Okay. J-Wars was a model of theater level war. It was a, it was a joint warfare system. Uh, most modern militaries have extensive what they call operations research departments. For instance, I guarantee you the Pentagon has a plan if the Iranians do something like drop mines in the, state, in the, in the Straits of Hormuz. So when the President gets a phone call at 3 o'clock and he calls up the Secretary of Defense and says, what are we going to do about this? They have plans for most of the things that can be, so it can be thought of. So they're not only planning for, for future conflicts, but they're also, they're also using these models to do things like uh, assess do we have enough forces of this type to handle these contingencies. You do things like uh, analyze different kinds of weapon systems. For instance, down at the bottom, we're talking about system trade-offs. Is the F-22 uh, that much better at playing than is the F-18? The answer is yes. So models are used for this kind of purpose. Um, and they, do, they run scenarios and then do actual war games. So, JWAR started off in 95. Congress told DOD to build a joint model. The uh, services had long had and still do have their own models. And you would not, not be surprised to find out that the Army's model says that, well, we need more tanks, and the Air Force's model says we need more airplanes. So the point here was to have a multi sided model, which means we, we would play red and blue, good and bad. And we would be able to model not only current conflicts, but future things. Some of the uh, scenarios we did were 2012, I can't tell you where, but uh, looking into the out <coughs> looking into the out years. And the other thing that was unique about JWARS is it was a C4ISR model. C4ISR is a big word for command, control, communications, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. What that means is we actually played perception in the model. We actually flew airplanes out and looked at things. And the model uh, changed its mind about what it was going to do based on, on the perceived perception. So, for instance, if it were a cloudy day, perception wouldn't be as good, and the model of the war fight wouldn't go as well as if you were in a sunny day in uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay. So, yeah, there is no man in the loop. Some of the models the DOD has actually will stop at a certain point, ask for operator intervention. This is closed form. Push the button ran as quickly as possible. Uh, it was uh, stochastic. Typically, um, uh, when you did runs for analysis, you'd do 30 or 40 runs, throw out the, st the, statistical, out the statistical outliers, and use um, then base your analysis on the stuff that was left in the middle. Uh, I already talked about we model sensors and, and, what, we, and what they see. Uh, some of the other models um, the services have assume perfect perception. They can not only see that that vehicle on the ground is a tank, not maybe a truck, but they know it's a T-72 tank. We don't do that. Makes them more interesting. We consider that kind of stuff cheating. Okay, this is uh, some statistics about J-Wars. I was there for most of the 15 years. Um, about a million two lines of code towards the end, 4.2 lines of code per method, which is pretty good because we had some long methods. And we spent a lot of time being the uh, relational data converter class, which is where we did the object to relational mapping. It was a major pain. We were stuck with Oracle. Uh, interrupt me if you have a quick question. But I'm going to try to go as fast as possible so we have time for questions. OK. Uh, this is just the organization. Most of the people who worked on the project were government contractors, they worked for companies like Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin. Those companies had the contract with the government to, to, um, to do the coding. Well, we had a government director, and uh, the, your, the, we were organized around these IPTs, what we call them various domains, because obviously things that happen in land are different than happen in air and space. Uh, we also had no dedicated testing team. Everybody was supposed to test their own code. 
And you all know how well that works out. Okay, this is a very cool slide. You may or may, may not have heard of the OODA loop. It was, uh, it was first uh, proposed by a colonel named John Boyd, the Air Force colonel. And the idea here is that the OODA loop is you observe, orient, decide, act. Now this shows both the bad guy and the friendly guy is the perception. So what you do is you start with your plan. And then what you do is you use C4ISR, your perception, to say, well, how's my plan going? Okay? Then you look here and you say, well, am I on plan or am I off plan? Well, if you're on plan, you keep you go back into the observe cycle. If you're off plan, well, then you need to make changes so that you, you can change what you're going to do, then you look again. And it's a big it's a big loop where you look, uh, analyze how you're doing, change if necessary, and then keep looking. And generally, you may have heard the term that one guy is inside and another guy is food a loop. It means they're, they're, they're able to make decisions and change their strategy about what they're doing more quickly than their, in this case, uh, enemy. But the same, same is true in business. If you're fast through the market, if you can, if you can analyze um, customer needs and get stuff out, you have a, a real advantage. It's basically plan do check X from the end, uh, but then Sorry? This is basically the plan do check act uh, yes. from yes. that. Yeah. Yes. And the military term is UDA. So here you have the, you know, the, the, oh, sorry, the fog of perception. All right, this is a really old chart. It's not real interesting, but it kind of shows, you know, the organization had platform domain and then the problem domains. This is where most of the stuff happened. And then we had these managers. I'll talk a little bit more about them. Originally, we had to support, I think, three major platforms. They quickly came that, and in the end, we all the uh, GUI stuff ran on Windows, and the simulation ran on uh, Windows and Linux boxes. Okay, the major thing in, in, uh, in JWAR is what we call a BSE, a Battle Space Editor. And a Battle Space Editor is anything that really can shoot or be shot. It can be a tank, an airplane, a ship, or even a bridge. You can shoot a bridge and destroy. Okay, the way that we gave BSEs behavior is they have assets. A BSE would have fuel, ammo, personnel, stuff like that. Um, and we also play logistics, so BSEs would have uh, two levels. They'd have their authorized and their on hand level. And say, so for land units, when their ammunition would get to a certain level, they would automatically order more stuff from to, you know, to be brought into the war fight. This, this is a big deal because logistics is, is a very big deal in, in modern warfare. Uh, I forget what the statistic is, but a, a soldier consumes several tons of stuff every day, just in things like food and water and ammo, and that's even before you get into dragging gas to during the tanks. It's huge. Okay, so BSEs have capabilities depending on what assets they have, and we use this to, to um, to affect the war fight. For instance, an airbase needs to have a runway. So if the bad guys kill your runway by cratering it, you can't fly airplanes. So the level or the state of the BSE's assets would, was used to, to directly affect how much capability it had. Uh, plane, we, we played, uh, the planes would actually crash when we ran out of gas, although there was a switch that says, we have magic gas, so don't worry about that. And, um, Land units could actually be attributed to the point where they would route. And here's another example. If you kill the radar of a surface air missile, the missile's no good. Okay, as I said, some models do magic gas and magic resupply. Um, we thought that was cheating. Uh, the services hated JWARS. They just hated it. Uh, number one, they couldn't control it. They knew how they had their own models. They knew how to, um, shall we say, fiddle them to get the uh, answers they wanted. And it wasn't possible to fill, fill J words without leaving fingerprints around. Um, here are some of the sticks they used to beat uh, J words with. I'll let you guys look at those. Just anything they could think of was a good reason to beat J words. They actually refused to use the results of some J words studies. They just said, if J words is included in this study, we will not sign, sign on to it. And the civilian leadership never kicked their butts. Okay, the end of JWARS. In 2003, there was a presidential budget directive that says no money can be in the federal budget 
for a line item called J-Wars. So what they did is they renamed the program to Jazz. <laughs> so even so, the funding got cut 50%. In 2007, it closed the main office. Um, it got kind of uh, reawakened in 2008 with staff of four. I was one of them, thank goodness. And at the end of 2010, it was uh, uh, canceled for good for supposedly budgetary reasons. But the head of the only organization was a civilian woman who used to work for the Navy, and her deputy was a Navy admiral. So that might be the business. Okay. I'm sure you've seen some of these, but uh, one of the major problems we have is we didn't really do a good job of managing customer expectations. We made, not me personally, but some of the management made wild promises about what we were going to deliver. When we were going to deliver, we were known as the PowerPoint model for a long time. The first version we shipped, you couldn't change any of the data. So it's not, you know, not really useful like that. Um, the teams I, I was on, we always tried to burn the promise and over deliver. If you do that, you look like a genius. If you do it the other way, you look like an idiot. Um, this was a management failure. We had, we had internal disputes that went on forever. The example here is who owned attack helicopters? Land or air? That decision that that decision was never made, and it didn't really matter which way they which way they decided, but they never decided, and it just it just made life crazy. And then the whole idea of a BSE life cycle: BSE gets stood up, it gets resupplied, but at a certain point, is it inactive because the runway is damaged? Um, we just never resolve these fundamental questions about what. Uh, methods such as is dead and is active mix. You're never really sure if you send the BSE, the message is dead. Well, does that mean he's gone or he's damaged? He come back. It was very uh, frustrating. And then the other thing management didn't do is they didn't enforce their own standards. We had this big standards book. We had the, uh, the small top coding standards book. Nobody enforced it. So there was a great deal of unhappiness. And as always, politics trumps technology. I'm sure you've all seen that one. Uh, the civilian leadership never went back for us against, against, the, Navy, against the services. And so the services won all, the, won all the battles. And they just outweighed the changes in civilian leadership, and eventually we were dead. The other problem was our first director was there for about four years, uh, actually for, forbade the, the, the civilian people working for him from taking JWARS outside the office and trying to sell it and get it in other organizations to consider it a research project. And you gotta do what the government guy says. Okay. There's some small talk stuff. Small talk made JWARS possible. Okay. We get extensive use of blocks, re reification of code. Um, I would say small talk's greatest virtue is that the cost of change is so low that you're not you're not afraid to do it. Um, we went me personally went down many wrong roads. When I first did satellites, I'll actually, I'll actually tell you this. I think it's later in the slide. When I actually did satellites, I uh, I subclassed them off aircraft, and I got them in the code, I got them in a scenario, and the damn things didn't run. They didn't run, and I finally got in the debugger, and I found out that because this because the satellites were aircraft, they were trying to take off, and because they didn't have a radio interface to the air traffic to the to the, uh, to the tower, they never took off. Well, at that point, <laughs> I'm serious. At that point, I said, "We're not subclassing satellites from aircraft." So we ripped them out, and they were really just virtual. They were just these things that kind of appeared overhead at certain times of the day and took pictures in various spectrum, you know, infrared um, or real pictures. And, and resolution. They didn't really have to fly because we never modeled anti satellite weapons. Yes? Is the kind of, is the kind of reasoning that come from that kind of stuff too? Was that your system? What's that? But there's, there was an anecdote about uh, one of these simulation systems, and I want to know if it was yours, in which someone subclassed a kangaroos of soldiers because they wanted that one. A helicopter would fly over and would scramble, and the problem is the helicopter would go over and then the helicopter would shoot it. <laughs> I, I heard that. I think it was a simulation in Australia. It wasn't us, but I, I oh, did hear that okay. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
we would have been we would have been toast if we'd use a language a language that's static types because you just have to change your code all the time either because you didn't do the implementation correctly or the, the, uh, the people that more domain knowledge came back and said no no we're gonna we're gonna use this adjudication method so the flexibility of small doc was was just fantastic. Okay, overlays. Uh, we had, we uh, developed tables originally in a uh, classified environment in the last four years. Was developed in an unclassified environment, but it was almost always used in a secret environment. So it was very difficult to get stuff in the secret environment. So now they want to scan your disk packs and look for viruses, and you have to go through a security officer and let it out. The security officer and let it in. It's, it's just a major pain, even for even for critical fixes. So what we did is we, we came up we came up with this idea of, of, of over it wasn't me, we came up with this idea of overlays and in the 300 megs of scenario data you, you have, we had a place in place in there we later developed a GUI, I'll show you this, well, right here. You could take for instance the, the method weather band in air ground target, which would normally ask the target, what's your weather band? Is it sunny and clear? Is it cloudy? And this would affect the results of Adjudication. These weather bands were just numbers from one to six, and that would affect how how good the hit was. So let's say you want to play cloudy all the time. Two. Well, there was a GUI there. You could go in and you could say, okay, for the method weather band of JW Air Ground Target, make it two. And what happened is that as the simulation started up, we go through the, these overlays and method source, compile them. And that would be the code that was used during the run. And we use these for lots of things. We use, we use them for patching bad code and also for playing what if type stuff. So this will allow a guy to, for instance, if he just wanted to say, okay, I got this simulation going, what happens if the weather is always cloudy? He can go into your override weather band, make it a two, and his weather would always be cloudy. But he, he wouldn't have to go in and change all the objects in the scenario to make the weather really cloudy, he would just force the cloudy value into the calculation. These were uh, wildly popular. We had a woman from uh, MITRE who, uh, you, know, you know the old saying, if, if your only uh, tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Well, <laughs> every problem looked like an over, like it needed an overlay. And by the time, in the eight months where there were no professional J, J warriors in the product, this woman wrote over 500 overlays. So we get this back and say, okay, here's 500 overlays. Why don't you merge them into the main line of the code? All right, let's see. So, yeah, here's talking about the 500. So, so the problem was, how do you how do you reconcile 500 overlays? Well, you can sit there and you know, do browse changes and you look at the stuff, but you can't even really really compare the source code, source code because one line feed, one extra line feed over here means the source string doesn't compile. So one morning I was thinking about this and, and it kind of came to me. I said, I know what we could do. We could compile both of them and we could look at the byte codes. And if the byte codes are the same, it doesn't matter what the source is. So we changed around the, the overlay GUI to to, to do this kind of filtering, and then we could, then once we thought we had integrated the overlay into, into our base code, it would show up as equal byte codes. Another cool thing, possible only because you get small time. Uh, that's not that right here. Okay, um, most, not most, but many, many uh, simulation models are scripted. For instance, at hour 200, we know that there's going to be a counterattack because we will achieve air superiority. Well, sometimes the war doesn't go that way. Sometimes we want to see what happens if the war doesn't go that way. So we had a, uh, a knowledge base, which is kind of a fuzzy fact rule system. So the model could, could do things, it, could, it had things like facts. So you could say that if the perceived enemy fire strength which was a small top method is less than 50%, then we can say, okay, we have air superiority. And then you could you could link actions to these facts so that for instance, when you achieve air superiority, then the the model would, would transition its state to counterattack. So it might happen at hour 190, might happen at hour 220, 
But the analysts love this because it was much more realistic than always having counterattack happen in our two winter. And again, this was small talk code that we actually kept in scenario data and evaluated. It was actually blocks and we evaluated the runtime. Okay, this was one I don't think our boss ever really understood. So, uh, we had a, uh, a big cluster of machines that have high performance computing center in Charleston. And uh, we had the ability from um, Crystal City, Virginia to um, log into, well, actually, you, you start up JWARS and you'd be asked, okay, where, which, which of these jacks, which was the, the kind of the central control program where you could kick off numbers of simulations to say, do I want to log into Charleston, do I want to log into Aberdeen? And that's where these jacks would be running. And so you'd log in there and say, okay, I want to do 30 runs of scenario B. Boom, you kick that off and later you go back and look at the results. So since this was actually a small talk image, and then we had a J Wars image up a J Wars image up in Washington. So what we did is we kind of well, first of all, we asked the guys at Charleston who were very security conscious, is it okay if we write to the directory where our images live? And they said, sure, no problem. So, so what we did is we slipped into, into this JAX image in Charleston. The next time uh, we, we deployed it, we uh, slipped into, into it some code like this, read from a stream right to a file name. So then, then, what you, then what you have to do is you, you fire up a development image, you connect to Charleston, and then you open up an inspector and that guy, which means you are now talking to the JAX image down here. And this JAX image knows how to do this. So from your development image, you do something like this. You tell the image down in Charleston, hey, here's a stream of stuff coming in. Why don't you save it under this name? So this way we were actually able to push updates to the code without going through security. <laughs> our boss, I don't think our boss really ever understood this, but he, 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 didn't, he didn't ask too many questions. But yeah, it was, you know, it was just, you know, the Jack City to Charleston, you knew how to do this, you just fire up. There it was. It was great. We were really proud of this. Brian came up with that one. Okay. So here's some funny G words there, so I'll let you guys just kind of read several days to figure out. Especially one where the airplanes wouldn't fly we never thought that you know red had cheated and Kim on the Air Force was the worst one. <laughs> Who do that? And this first one, I, I, I remember when this was happening, we were working on the sensor code. It was a mess. We spent months getting the sensor code to work. And all of a sudden the guys from logistics came around and said, hey, our transporters just saw a scud. Yes. But it was 30 miles. 30 kilometers in the rear of enemy territory. Everybody got that? I got some more.
means the same as B-52 generally gets shot down.
who allowed the user to specify, okay, I want these seven instruments instead of all 300, and then he would he would basically take um, output from the sim while it's while it's running and blow it out for in big blobs. Uh, and then the simulation manager, he just uh, he kind of controlled everything and that's what was going on. Say a little bit about uh, we we used Oracle for our uh, our store, and we made uh, extensive use of um, blobs. We would take we would take uh, all the objects in JWORS. We had to serialize themselves, serialize and deserialize themselves to blobs, and we found that was a, a great deal faster faster for not only starting up the sim but but running the sim than full around with Oracle tables. We were under tremendous pressure all through this to, to run quickly. 15? Okay, good. That's okay. Thank you. Tremendous pressure to run as quickly as possible. Our uh, original uh, design, the original requirements, like 15 years ago, said we had to run 1,000 to 1 uh, real time, which means you'd have to, you'd have to execute uh, 24 hours of a war fight in like 90, I think it's 93 seconds. Well, we got up to about 600 but really only because of a faster hardware. Uh, this was another stick that they used to beat JWARS. It was completely, completely crazy um, requirement because of the other models, and there's one that we're using now that runs twice the time. So we got held with a possibly high standard. It was awful. Okay, that's all I got. We got 15 minutes. Um, yeah. Does any of this work? Uh, Thank you. Does any of this work have to do with um, not just computer cartoon, but the actual um, table game cartoon? Um, first of all, I don't know what uh, harpoon is, so I, I'd say probably not. We did originally have a, when we were designing the, uh, the knowledge base and trying to make the, you know, the, the, the simulation more intelligent you know, as much as you can. We did have for a while in there a, a, a guy who designed games to talk to him about, Ooh, I don't remember, it was like 12 years ago, so I, you know, I have no idea. But that was the extent of our connection with, with gaming. Okay. Uh, that you're using blobs in Oracle, that suggests that you don't feel that Oracle was really the nice resistance tool, or? Oh. Okay, we used Oracle for two things. We used it to store scenario data. Uh, we, we had, um, you could re represent a JWAR scenario. I mean, let's say you're doing 2012 Nicaragua, which we weren't. <laughs> As you develop a scenario, you'd have Wednesday's version, and then Mike here would come in, he'd fix up the air code, and he'd run that to see how it So it's an iterative process. So we have, in Oracle, you know, thousands of these scenarios, and eventually they'd get the one that everybody liked, and that's the one they would run for for, for analysis, okay? Well, the, the scenario was actually um, was actually stored at Oracle in 19, 19, each scenario was stored in 19 different blobs, and so when you selected the scenario, these blobs were decompressed into pretty much um, a lar large scenario data object, which is basically a bunch of lookup tables. You have a lookup tables of a lookup table of BSE types, aircraft carriers, tanks, stuff like that. You have a lookup table of assets, fuel, um, ammo, things like that. Then when you so that was the first use of work. Okay. Then when you started the simulation, you you would take the scenario the scenario object that you already had kind of in memory. You push the go button. And what the software would do is it would take the stuff that was pretty much in lookup tables and it would, and it would stand up the actual small talk JWARS objects as quickly as possible. This could take a little bit of six minutes. Okay. Now as you're running, what you want to do is you want to output the instrument data as quickly as possible. So what we did is, I mean, if the instrument data was 100, 200 bytes long each record, so you don't want to be going out to Oracle, you know, one or 200 bytes. So they, they would bundle this stuff up into a big blob and you know, set some pointers about where and where. And I think you could, there was a setting in the INI file about 
how many records? Yeah, I think generally once you've got 250 records in a blob, then you would go out and write. Okay, so Oracle was used to store scenario data and was used to store output. But we did no Oracle recovery whatsoever. We didn't do, we didn't do commits, we didn't do rollbacks, we didn't do recovers. If Oracle crashed, too bad. Because speed was everything. Did they ask a question? Yes, that sounds like it was not really used as yours. So you both use Oracle and No, we didn't. We didn't. And we, you know, every time we it sounds like a bad fit for the problem. Yeah, it was it was just a it was just a repository. Just a huge just a huge repository. We found that the individual table rights, rec, right, rights to individual tables were way too slow. Way too slow. So we came up with a blob scheme. And that that worked pretty well. It was a, Pretty clever what they did. Anybody else? We have ten minutes. As I as I understood, you were the subcontractor to some prime contractor. Who did the original estimation work? You mean about how long it would take? 